It's time for Drummer Nation. Michael Carvin's musical training began at age six with his father, one of the top drummers in Houston, Texas. By the age of 12, Carvin began playing professionally and won what would be the first of five consecutive Texas Rudimental Championships. Joining Freddie Hubbard's band in 1973, Michael moved to New York where he quickly gained a reputation as one of the most formidable drummers on the jazz scene while working with Dizzy Gillespie, Dexter Gordon, Hank Jones, McCoy Tyner, Hampton Hawes, and singers Ruth Brown and Johnny Hartman. Michael Carvin has established himself as one of the world's most respected drum teachers and clinicians. The alumni of the Michael Carvin School of Drumming in New York are among the elite drummers in music today. Sound Synergies Percussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Percussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. Check out their website at soundsynergies.net. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Today, I tried out some of the new HH Vanguard Series Sabian cymbals, and they sound great. Very warm, a little bit more low end. Sticking is a bit sharper and wide. It's a bit of a wider sound, it's not a point pointed sound. I can really get into other sides of electronic music, acoustic jazz, folk music, using brushes, using mallets, really warm, simple, really widespread. The sizes are great. My favorite being the 21, 22, those inches uh, size cymbals give me more definition and I can crash and ride the cymbal in the same stroke almost. It's a beautiful uh, connection between getting loud bashes and getting stick definition while still keeping time. Hint Stick Practice Drumsticks by Sam Ruttenberg. These drumsticks are new and improved and help drummers understand proper grip, finger technique, and rebounds so drummers can play more easily. The patented contoured swivel pads rotate to allow drummers the feel of an unencumbered, free-floating stroke. Hi folks, I'm Johnny Vidakovich down here in New Orleans and I just want to let you know that I love music and I love you and I'm doing some Skype lessons. And if you want to hook up with me on Skype, that information is on the screen. It would be great if we hooked up. Peace and love, Johnny V. And everybody says about you that, you know, a teacher in the arts is not exactly a guy who's just going to demonstrate technique for you. And teacher in the arts has to be something of a guru, of a life coach, you know, who, who helps you to learn how to play the instrument and to be a functioning, positive human being on this planet. And I know that you're interested in your students in a, a way that's much larger than just playing the drums. Is that correct? Yes, well, well, well. A drum is a human being, Michael. Uh huh. <laughs> well, you have a way of, of being very uh, cryptic and cutting it right to the point. But, but yeah, so you're looking at holistically a whole human being there and not just saying, hey, you got to work on your left hand. It all goes together, right? Yeah, well, well, well you see, when a guy comes to me, he's already a drummer. Mm -hmm. He just needs the only thing I do, like I tell my students, I can't teach you how to play drums. I'll introduce you to yourself. And once you know who you are, you don't have to play drums. You can do whatever you want to do. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, exactly. Helping a person to find out who they are as an individual. The other thing I look at is, uh, I think you would agree with this, as a leader is not the guy who keeps everybody in line and checks off the boxes. That might be a foreman. It might be a supervisor. But a leader is somebody who inspires people. And I think that uh, all the students, people I've talked to who have come under your guidance, Excite you in that regard as a leader? Well, 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 you see, I've never advertised, Michael, and the reason why I never advertise because I always want to have the upper hand. You see, when a student come to me, he know what he's signing up for. So therefore, once they step out of line, I tell them to get out. Mm -hmm. So you're only Just dealing like that, Michael. I don't hold hands. I don't change diapers. I hear you. I hear you. Um, I did not advertise. I did not advertise. I did not lure you in to me. Mm -hmm. And you have the benefit so, of only working with serious drummers who really want to be functioning musicians on this planet. Yeah, well, you, you know, man, the, uh, uh, the only thing we have realistically in life is time. And not that much of that, huh? Hello. 
<laughs> when you compare it to the sky, the ocean, the mountains, and the earth. There you go. Well, it's speaking of time. All we have is time, man, so I'm not going to waste mine. Let- and, 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 and I'm quite sure that a lot of these guys are nice guys, but I'm not in the nice guy business, Michael. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, see, because nice guys don't win anything. Well, but that doesn't mean you have to be an asshole either, right? Well, I'm not an asshole. I'm a sir and a gentleman. Uh-huh. Exactly. You carry yourself as a gentleman. And um, that solves a lot of problems right there. Well, 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 see, see, you see, everybody, in my opinion, have a lot of greatness within them. But if they are taken to that place, then they will never know that that place is inside of them. That's that's why I tell all of my students, Michael, I'd rather for you to hate me and be successful than to like me and be a failure. I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. My goal, like I tell all of my students, my goal before I die is to leave as many great drummers on the face of this earth as possible. Why? Why? Because when I was when 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 I was born, the earth, the United States of America, was full of great drummers, and that's the way I want to leave it. Well, that's that's. I mean, who can say anything other than thank you for that? And and uh, there's a list on your website of some of the great students you've had, and they are uh, among the best drummers we see out there today. Um, That's right. And 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 that's um, right. And, and 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 when I agree with you, I am not bragging or sticking my chest out. These are somebody else's children, man. They are not my children. They are my musical children, like mm-hmm. I tell them. And and after each lesson, as they pass by one another, the, uh, 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 if I have a student at one o'clock, he has to be there at twelve forty-five. If not, he gets no lesson. Mm-hmm. Why? Why does he have to be there at 1245? So when his brother leaves at 1 o'clock and I open that door, I say, brothers, brothers, drummers, drummers. And what I mean by that, I don't care what you look like. I don't care who your mother and father is. When you guys see each other, you respect each other as drummers. If you have an extra foot pedal that you don't need and he need a foot pedal, give it to him. Don't you think drummers are, are more brotherly like that than many of the other instruments? I mean, we have a thing There's every... no question about it, Michael. <laughs> we have a thing every year called PASIC that's a four-day love-in for drummers of all stripes. And nobody cares, uh, you know, if you're a, a classical guy or a jazz guy or rock or funk There's or world no percussion it, or because marching. the drums is the first musical instrument. The human voice is the first instrument. Mm-hmm. But the first musical instrument, meaning made by man, is the drum, man. That's right, and every every culture on the planet has percussion, of some sort or another. Of some sort, of some sort, yes, mm-hmm. sir. Mm-hmm. Of some sort, <laughs> of some sort. Now let's go. Let's go back for a second. You were early influenced by Papa Joe. Was he like your biggest influence? Yes. I, I met Papa Joe when I moved to New York. I moved to New York in 1963. When I left Houston, Texas at 18, I moved to Los Angeles, California. Mm-hmm. And I did studio work and I did the Barbara McMahon TV show for a year because that's what my father trained me to be. My father trained me to be a studio drummer. Mm-hmm. My father told me, he said, Michael, I do not want you working in saloons. I did that. Mm-hmm. Okay. He said, I want you to do studio work. That's why I'm a great sight reader, because my father was, because my father taught me. Everything that I know, he taught me how to tie my shoes. He taught me how to tie a tie. He taught me how to play the 26 rhythm. He taught me how to read any uh, music that man can write. Why? Because mathematically, our mother was a math professor. My middle brother had uh, his PhD in physics, Frederick Alonzo Carvin, that helped design the first cockpit in White Sands, New Mexico, to take the rocket to the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my middle brother. So uh, my sister has her master's degree in in math. She taught at Texas Southern University. So when I was growing up, I loved mathematics because I loved numbers. So when my father introduced me to music, 
call notes half note, the dot one placed after the note increases the note one half of this original value. Once my father introduced me to music, when I looked at it, I saw numbers. So, like I teach my students, if you know the two timetables, I can teach you how to read anything another man can write. Why? Why? Because you have a whole note equal two half notes. A half note equal two quarter notes, a quarter note equal two eighth notes, an eighth note equal two sixteenths, a sixteen equals two thirty seconds, a thirty second each equals two sixty fourth notes. Mm -hmm. That's it. But in it written music and it will fall within this combination. That's called syncopation. It okay? even it even then works we take it huh? It even works with triplets, two sixteenth note triplets are in an eighth note triplet. Two eighth note triplets are in a quarter note triplet. Michael, it works with everything. Mm -hmm. I, I think when 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 all of a, when I first um, started playing charts, I noticed that people could not count quarter note triplets. They would always you uh, ask the guy, say, "Man, how you play the quarter note triplets?" They'll say, "Da da da." I said, "No, no, I didn't ask you to sing them. I asked you to count them. Mm -hmm. How do you count quarter note triplets, man?" Uh, you ended up uh, working with a lot of luminaries on the West Coast in that period. I was basically doing commercial music. Uh, I used to play a jam session for Donald Bailey. He was the great drummer that made all those great records with Jimmy Smith. Right. And Donald played trombone and harmonica. So when I was 19, uh, I was in Donald Bailey's band. And he played trombone and harmonica, and I was playing playing drum. So uh, he was working with Hampton Hawes. Yeah, Hampton Hawes. So, I, I heard a video of you, saw a video with you playing with Hampton Hawes on YouTube. It was just outstanding, yeah. man. Just outstanding. A lot of people who may not know Hampton Hawes is a prominent West Coast 50s jazz musician who was uh, influential to, you know, he had a lot of gospel stuff, uh, came from Bud Powell and Nat Cole, and influenced a lot of people after him, like uh, Oscar Peterson. I like to throw these background things in for some kids who may not know this stuff. That's part of the reason we do this. So uh, I heard you playing with Hampton Hawes. Let's talk about oh, your personal. I, I, I'm hip. I'm hip. Let's talk about your personal playing style, because I hear a, a tremendous sense of joy and freedom in what you do. Sound Synergies Percussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Pedal Lube, the only product specifically designed for bass drum, hi-hat pedals and triggers, as well as all moving metal parts and drum hardware, safely removes grit, grime and other contaminants while protecting against harmful friction wear. Cymbal Care, restores and conditions cymbal surfaces without strippers or harmful polishes. Wear Barrier is a conditioning formula for all drum heads, rims and even sticks. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. My father uh, played drums and sang at the same time. So my father really taught me the importance of the lyrics. Mm -hmm. He said, make sure that any song that you are playing, if they are lyric to it, learn the lyrics. And I said, well, why? He said, so you can play to the changes instead of to the rhythm. Hmm. That's see, a good point. You see, if you know harmonically where the song is going. Not that you have to uh, be a drummer that can write it out. Do you, you, do you know, I can't write it out, but I can hear it. Mm, you know you the know? form. So I know, I know when those different colors are going to appear. That's why now, 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 now you're a symbol maker, right? I was, yes, sir. Yeah, so with my symbols, they are lightning, thunder, sunshine, and air. That's beautiful. And with my hi-hats, Michael, I call them interference. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elvin used to talk about them in colors, right? Huh? Elvin used to talk about his symbols in colors. Here's some purple over here, and here's some green, and mix in some yellow. Of course, of course, of course. See, so there are 11 octaves on the piano. That's why you have 88 keys, right? Yep. So he has 88 colors, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a drummer, I wanted to have as many colors as possible, but I didn't want to have 88 because that would be too much to carry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take that up the steps of the Amvets Club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it all looks different once you start schlepping that shit up steps, doesn't it? <laughs> I remember the first time I had to do that Michael live with three flights straight up and uh -huh. I said that night was the first time I actually played the drums with an understanding in what regard that was the first that was the first time I played the drums with an understanding because I realized if I have to bring it up all these steps I'm going to play something tonight. <laughs> I'm not wasting all that energy to get up here and mess around. Yeah, man. Come on, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. On, I like Michael, that. I like that. I'm going to damn sure have the fun. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, now you talk about your commercial endeavors, but you played with a lot of jazz greats. You played with Dizzy and Dexter Gordon, Jackie yeah, McLean, Hank Jones. I didn't come to New York until 1973. When, uh, when I left Texas in 1963, I moved to Los Angeles. I see. Then I was in uh, uh, the United States Army for two years. Well, thank you for your service. In Vietnam. You went to Vietnam? And then, huh? You went to Vietnam? Yes. Well, I was uh, an M60 machine gunner with the 89th Infantry Division. I went to, uh, I landed in uh, Cameron Bay. South Vietnam when I was 20 years old. As a matter of fact, I was 19, and three days later, I was 20. Yes. Well, that's a whole topic. I'm a I'll Vietnam just. Uh, veteran. Yes. I, that's a whole topic. I'll just say thank you for your service on that, and glad you got out of that without getting shot and killed. Um, a lot of guys don't realize that about me, but I'm a Vietnam veteran, man. Well, bless you for that. Uh, so you moved and, to. And, and, and. I didn't have to deal with any medication or none of that stuff because I never was there mentally. I was there physically. My mm -hmm. garbage was there, but my mind wasn't. Now, I'm, uh, I was an M6 machine gunner. So the life expectancy of the M6 machine gunner once in an enemy fire is three seconds mm -hmm. because she want to kill the man with uh, a fire superiority. Right. So what I did... What I did was I would find, I would play, uh, find, I would use the five stroke roll, 15, so every time I would find a, a burst of rounds, I would play a rudiment. That's interesting. I, I knew another guy who was made a gunner in the army because he was a drummer and he could hear the rounds as as uh, strokes yeah. of strokes of the rolls. Well, that's yeah. That's uh... so. So so. What create a shell shock soldier? When I came out of the army about ten years later, I went to the veterans administration and I had this concept. I say, guys, I can help heal sh uh, shell shell shock soldier from the Vietnam War because I was there. I heard the music that drove them crazy. Mm -hmm. They say you heard the what? I say I heard the music. Mm -hmm. That drove them crazy. I participated in the concert that drove them crazy because it was a concert. It was um, uh, napalm. It was uh, mortars. It was machine gun fire. It was M16 fire. It was uh, grenades. Each weapon has a different sound mm -hmm. and it has a different purpose. Okay? So in, in my first firefight in Vietnam, uh, it was about, about 15 hours, you know. And after we finished that, I was very, very afraid because how did you prepare for a war? I mean, how did somebody train you for the sound of it, okay? You can simulate pretending you're fighting, but you are hearing the true sound. You are hearing that uh, uh, peace of uh, sound. So after my first firefight, I told myself, I said, well, Michael, you have a choice. You can be scared for 12 months and end up a basket case, or you can come to grips with death and take it somewhere else. So what I did after my first firefight, I, I, I said to myself, as far as I'm concerned, I'm dead. And from that moment on, I wasn't afraid anymore. And then I started turning it into a positive experience. See, either you're going to be scared or you're going to be clear. 
Mm-hmm. I took the clear road. So once I took the clear road, I heard all of these sounds, Michael. That's why a, a guy told me what <laughs> I had been playing the drum solo. He said, man, he said, sometimes when you play your snare drum, it sounds like machine gun fire. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, I would have never known that. <laughs> Well, that's that's a fascinating story, and and uh, pulling the drummer aspect into that is just I've never heard anybody really articulate it that way, and it helped keep you well, kept well, you sane, well, man. That's the truth, Michael, because see, well, well I, 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 I'm I'm very lucky, Michael, because my father raised me to deal with situation at hand. Mm-hmm. That's the way my brothers and I were raised, growing uh, growing up in segregation in the state of Texas during during that time, my father had to teach his, his sons how to deal with situation at hand mm-hmm. and govern oneself accordingly. Mm-hmm. Well, I can so, see how you owe a lot to your father, but to your own intellect and your own uh, perseverance, too, and your own character. Uh, how did I imagine that held you in good stead when you find yourself on the bandstand with Freddie Hubbard or Dexter or Dizzy or those guys we were talking about? What's the correlation there? Well, you see, what happened, um, I was doing the Barbara McNair TV show in Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was always early because I was the librarian, so I could get a double. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I handed out uh, the music before the show, and I picked uh, the music up after the show and and gave the books to the conductor. Mm -hmm. So the violinist, uh, we had about 30 pieces. So the violinist, there was this guy, he's about 65, and he would come early of me uh, uh, quite a ways down and I would watch him but this particular time Michael he spoke to me without saying a word but he told me exactly what to do and I did it so he came in he had his back to me as always he sat down took his violin out of the case got his racing form cause he played uh, the horse and he had his carpet and he was set up but his vibration was telling me I was 24 and his his body vibration was saying to me, young man, once you go to New York and play and make a name, because you can come back and, and do studio work when you're my age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when that contract in, I, I had a little money. So I moved to San Francisco. Why? Why? Because I'd never lived in the city. Houston is spread out. California, Los Angeles is spread out. As you know, so I sold my car. I moved to San Francisco. Okay, I started. Uh, that was a jazz club. I lived right around the corner from a jazz club on uh, uh, the Visadero in in Haight Street. That was called the Both B O T H slash and A N D. The Both Band. It was owned by Delano Dean. I remember now, that club. I was familiar with, huh? I know about that club. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was familiar with Miles and, and Stan Getz and all of the stars, you know Monk and all of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to go by this, this jazz club because keep in mind, I moved to San Francisco only to practice. I didn't want to work with anybody. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to practice because I couldn't play fast, Michael. I could play medium, but I couldn't play real fast. So I wanted to get my stuff together to move to New York. Okay, so I said, I'll stay in San Francisco for two years to learn how to live in a city, and then I'll, I'll move to New York. So I would go by this jazz club every night, so I got uh, the know the Leno, but he used to play different records, man, that I'd never heard of jazz cats. Gretchen, Moncar the Third, Jack and McLean, and cats like that uh, mm-hmm. that I'd never heard. Uh, Oscar Brown Jr., and I was like, wow, man. So, uh, it's a lot of Blue Note category, catalog, right? Yeah, so I told the lady no Dean, I said, man, look, I'll come and clean your club up during the day <laughs> if you turn me on to the obscure jazz cats. There you go. He said, really? I said, yeah. So I would come and I would take the glasses off the table from the night before, empty the ashtrays and wash the ashtrays and the uh, glasses and sweep the place. And he would be playing these of these records and explaining it to me. Mm-hmm. So he said, man, why won't you uh, work with uh, Bobby Hutchison? Bobby lives here 
in San Francisco. So I told him, I said, well, man, I, I really don't want to work with anybody. I just w want to practice. He said, man, well, uh, why don't you work with Bobby? I said, okay. So he hooked it up, and I started working with Bobby Hutchins. So <laughs> then I heard the Red Clay album, right? Yeah, Freddie Hubbard. So, yes. So prior to the Red Clay record, I had never knew that guy's were playing those type of tempos. You know, like, red clay, da 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 <laughs> I said, well, I can play this. <laughs> so I said, okay, then Freddie Hubbard is going to be my ticket into New York because my father told me, he said, I told him, I said, Daddy, I'm thinking about moving to New York. Uh, he said, okay, Michael. He said, but go to New York with a hot band so everybody will come to check you out instead of you going into town by yourself and spending a lot of money for you to check everybody else out. He said, so set yourself up so everybody have to come to you. Great advice. I said, okay. So I, 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 I learned all the tunes on the Red Clay record, right? Mm -hmm. I learned all the tunes. So when when Freddie, so uh, the Leno Dean say, well, uh, who you want me to bring from New York so you can check out? I said, well, see if you can hire Freddie's band. He said, <laughs> okay. So he hired Freddie's band. So for six nights, I was standing in the back of the club and watched Freddie play. I wouldn't say nothing to nobody. That was back I when you could do that. Watch. That was back when artists, well, you could do that. Art, clubs would bring people in for a week, and you could just go to school on them every night and, and maybe meet yeah. them and hang in the daytime. It's hard to do these days. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. So so you, you were, yeah, you so were just the, digging the band the, every night. Well, yeah, but uh, see, Delano started believing in me. But mm -hmm. Because he could see that I was sincere and that I had the strategy. Mm -hmm. see, see, anybody is willing to deal with anybody. Hey, man, it's just like when you went into your summer business. You had to talk to somebody, but they saw that you had a concept. So they said, well, hey, man, I'll invest in it or whatever. Right, it's got to be a whole mutual thing. Exactly. And he could see that I was sincere about the music. So so I, I watched the band now. I, I, I watched the band with cotton in my ears because I didn't really want to hear what they was playing because I had already studied the music. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do, I wanted to watch Freddie Hub Hubbard's behavior. Mm -hmm. Who did he relate to? If see, see, if a horn player, especially a trumpet player, why he's not so on? If he's standing by the piano side, that means he's influenced by the harmonics. If if he's standing between the piano, that means he listens to the bass player. Like most female singers, listen to the bass. They don't listen to the piano. They don't listen to the drummer. So I knew that if he stood on the hi hat side, he was influenced by the drums. So anytime Freddie wasn't playing in his solo. He was standing on the hi hat side, so I said, "Okay." So he he's influenced by the drums, so I got him already. But I have to figure out something to say that will totally freeze his mind, mm -hmm. because I had to paralyze his mind from one to two seconds so I could get his attention. And he came and up playing with Art Blakey, so you got your work cut out for you there. Exactly, and this is some of the teachings that I learned in Vietnam. I'll be damned. I learned how to think in, in, in Vietnam. Before I went to Vietnam, I didn't know how to think. When I left Vietnam, I knew how to think. I knew how to look at a situation and, and figure it out. Just like that, I had to, uh, I would have gotten killed. So I knew I, I had made a jazz record, Michael. I knew I hadn't lived in New York. I already know that. Don't nobody have to tell me that. So I had to say something to Freddie. So after uh, the gig, on Saturday night, mind you, I went to Freddie. Now, I haven't been there since Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I just stood in the back. I ain't said nothing to nobody. Saturday night, I walked up to him. I said, hey, Mr. Hubbard, my name is Michael Cobb. And, and he just looked at me. And I looked him straight in the eyes. And I said, if you want to sound good in the future, you should hire me. And I turned <laughs> around and walked off. <laughs> That's great. What did he say to that? 
I don't know, because I turned turn around, around and walked walk away. <laughs> well, he must have believed you, because you ended up going to New York with him, right? I turned around. It wasn't about him. It was about me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He didn't need me. I needed He was my ticket to New York, Michael. Exactly. And I was going to get this ticket. So I came back Sunday night. After the gig, I walked up to him. I said, hey, Freddie. My name is Michael Cobb. And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, if you want to sound good in the future, you should have me. He just said, oh, man, you can't play. I just turned around and walked off. <laughs> so the next, his next kid was at the Lighthouse in, in L.A. Hermosa Beach, I yeah. was the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach. Beach. Yeah, right. I had just left L.A., so I had a lot of friends. I lived down there for 10 years. Uh -huh. I got down there on a Tuesday night. I came to the lighthouse every night, the Saturday night. I walked up to Freddie Hubbard. I said, hey, Freddie, my name is Michael Carvin. He looked at me and smiled. He said, well, what are you doing? You following me or something? <laughs> I said, look, man, if you want to sound good in the future, you should hire me. He said, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, you can't play drums. I said, y you can say whatever you want to say to me. He said, once you set in tomorrow night, I, uh, I say, I'm not going to say that. He said, I know you can't play. I said, Freddie, you're going to give me one shot, man. And my family taught me if I'm going to get a break to put my best foot forward, I said, I'll bring my drums here tomorrow. Mm hmm and set them up on the floor during the day anytime you tell me and you come down here and you and I play. I say, but I'm not going to step on your bandstand. He say, why not? I say, first of all, because I respect you and your bandstand. Second of all, if you just had a great first set or a bad first set, I cannot lock into that spirit or that vibration. Mm -hmm. That's when I noticed he started paying attention. I say, thirdly, Lenny White drums are for Lenny White to play. My drums are, are for me to play. I said, you wouldn't set in on another guy's trumpet. That's right. And then he smiled. He uh, he smiled. He said, man, give me your phone number. <laughs> I gave him my business card. Two weeks later, he called me. There you go. I think most drummers, many people don't realize that when you sit in, man, the cards are stacked. The deck is stacked against you. You don't know what you're playing. Everything's at the wrong height and the wrong tilt. You're not supposed to move anything around. And every sound is different than what you expect. And the band's out of vibe and everything's, I mean, you just, you got your work Come cut on, out for Michael, you to sit in you like that. Yes, I've been there too, man. I get, I get it. I totally get it. Of course, man. I'm not going to let a guy set me up and I need him. He don't need me. I've got to have the upper hand, Michael. Mm -hmm. I've got to have it or I'm going to lose, man. You know and that? I don't believe in losing. There's a great story with uh, Jazz at the Philharmonic. Buddy is on the, on the tour and so is uh, Roy Haynes. And Roy sits down to play Buddy's kit and he hears Roy behind him, uh, he hears Buddy behind him saying, as they are, Roy. <laughs> you know, like, don't be messing with my shit, man. You gonna play my drums? Sit down exactly. and play my drums. So exactly, man. You were too smart to fall for that. That's great. That's great. Uh, well, exactly, man. Well, well, well. See, my father. I, the, 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 uh, uh, it, it was very interesting. So, so anyway, that's how I got to New York. I think what. Our symbols uh, brought to the Sabian uh, family is that there is more, lots more hand hammering. They're all hand hammered, and so you really have to perfect the hammering technique and where to hammer on the symbol. You know, you don't want to get the symbol too thin in a lot of places. They were willing to try it, and I think we came out with with a great product that uh, that is a great musical instrument. Once you get to New York with that type of act, so the, uh, the plan the, the tour, plan worked. I flew in the, huh? the plan worked. But you went there with a hot gig, and people were coming to check you out. Exactly. Well, let's talk about exactly. your person, your playing style. You list Joe Jones, Pop Joe, as one of your all-time idols. He came, you know, he came up in the '30s, and um, your yeah. playing is very modern. Um, uh, how do you yeah. approach? You know, I think of drumming as it progressed from being a timekeeping element to being more and more interactive, more and more interactive, freeing of each limb to be independent. And you have that freedom in, in your playing. Is that something you always heard, or was that something you worked on? Or You know what I mean? It's quite different than a Papa Joe well, approach. Well, well, well see, see, through discipline comes freedom. Hmm. 
I didn't grow up doing anything. Nothing is 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 organic to me except breathing. Uh, I'm a student of Jim Chapin. Okay. I'm a student. My father had me and Jim Chapin. I was ten years old. I had. I'm a student. I loved it. The, the three books that I've been teaching out of for forty three years are the same three books my father taught me out of. Ted Reed. Syncopation. Syncopation. Uh -huh. Jim Chapin, advanced technique for uh, the modern drum, and Charles Wilcox and rudimental drum solos. That's it. <laughs> That's all you need, man. That's in spite of all That's the great. It. There's so much great education material out there that deals with. Uh, you know, left foot clave and all kinds of crazy shit. But, I mean, that's what you just spelled out is is perfect. And you know what I liked about the Chapin book? Those are songs he's got written in those exercises. You know what I mean? You might be thinking it's... Hey, da -da -da -da. Man, man, hey, hey, man, Chapin and I were good friends. We both belonged to Sag Harbor Golf Course. I started playing golf when I was 50, and um, uh, uh, my beautiful bride and I uh, had a summer home out there. And I met Chapin, and I thanked him. Mm -hmm. For writing the book, mm -hmm. but it's, I thanked him for it's, uh, it's, for writing the book because but, that book introduced me to Michael Carden. How so? Well, see, I'm uh, I'm a great student of the instrument. Uh, that's why, if you notice, when I play, I play very even and clean. Mm -hmm. Now that's the twenty six rudiment. But that's Jim Jim Chapin. See, when you play the eight note section of Jim Chapin, that's the second section in his book. Right. The eight note section. Once you play that, that will clean the left hand up. Okay, so he had you play it straight eighth straight eighths under the swing pattern, right? Well, that's the way it's written. Well, yeah, I know, but some people have interpreted the eighths as swing, which makes it no different than the triplet oh, I section. I understand. That when uh, when students come to me, Michael, all of them. It has never failed. When all of them come to me, I'll, I'll turn to the eighth note section of Chapin, and they are playing like a dotted eighth note tied to sixteen. Right, right, right. So, 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 so I will turn back to the page with the dotted eighth note tied to sixteen, and I say, "Well, play this for me." And they'll play it the same way. And then I'll turn back to the straight eighth note page. I say, "Now play this mm -hmm. one," and they'll play it uh, 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 the same way. <laughs> I say, "Man, how can you call a dog a cat?" <laughs> Yeah, good point. You have to. Oh, that really opens up your technique, but your independence, because it's it's difficult to do, and and to keep both of those I mean, flows I mean, going at the same it's time. A, a guy, guys, are come, come to me and they, Well, my teacher told me that you uh, that this the way you swing the eighth note. I say, well, I'm I'm very glad you tell your teacher that uh, Michael Carvin said thank uh, uh, thank you for teaching you because without your teacher. You couldn't have gotten to me. I'd say, but now let's talk about what Mr. Chapin wrote. Not Michael Carvin, mm -hmm. not your teacher, Mr. Chapin. Let's talk about what Mr. Chapin wrote. Let's mm -hmm. play what Mr. Chapin wrote. And this mm -hmm. not Michael Carvin book. So you can say the hell with Michael Carvin. Play what Mr. Chapin wrote. That's what's in the book, yeah. Because if you don't play it as written, then how can you get to play in the second trumpet part in a big band with your left hand? The other thing I liked about the Chapin book is it's musical phrases. It's not dot 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 dot. That's things ain't what they used to be. Ba ba da ba da do de ba ba. You know what exactly, I mean? Exactly, exactly. That's uh, uh, man. It's, uh, there are a lot of great things in that book. My mama and told me in that Christmas section. Ba da 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 Blues in the night. Blues in the night. Yeah, yep. man. Yeah, man. When, look, I used to play golf with Chapin, and I would tell him every time I saw him, I say, Chapin, thank you so much, man, because uh, we got the book in 1950. Mm -hmm. 19, uh, uh, no, 1954. I was 10 years old, and. It just opened me up. You see, my father had the big band charts and all of that stuff. And I used to listen to a uh, Lostford band a lot. But uh, but now I'm going to tell you a drum I really dug. Who's that? I'm going to tell you a drum I really dug. I, uh, I don't know his name. I dug Spike Jones drummer. Yeah, who was that? I don't know who that was either. Well, that was a difficult Spike gig, Jones man. Spike Jones drummer turned me on. 
on to the freedom. Really? Uh, nobody would have ever yeah, guessed yeah, that. See, I used to listen to Spike Jones on the radio. Uh-huh. On, on Friday night, they would do a Spike Jones hour because his drums are on shops included. Have a new Right. For people who don't know, Spike Jones did a lot of what they might have called novelty tunes back then, where he would take songs and put crazy stuff mixed into it. But it was always very articulately done and very musical and a lot of intricate arranging. But his drama made the band the band. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, man, man. That, so, so that's how I got to my kind of style of play well. Play Chapin. We're coming near the we're coming near the end. I've got a lot of great stuff here, man. I hope our readers and well listeners can uh, can gain from this insight as as to who you are as a person and what makes you such a great artist and such a great mentor. Um, I, I, I'm honored that you did my show. Anything you want to wrap up with? Well, you, you know, uh, the only thing that that I would like to say to young uh, drummers. Study the instrument. Study the instrument. But most of all, fall in love with the music. Fall in love with the music. I'll say it one more time. Study the instrument, but fall in love with the music. And if you take care of the music, young great drummers, the music will take care of you. <laughs> well, we'll leave it at that, and I sure appreciate your time. Um... And where are, you, where are you living now? I live in New Jersey. That's what I thought. So next time I'm up in New York, but, I'm, but, I'm but gonna the look you up. Carbon School of Drumming is on uh, is in Manhattan. Right. Well, I'm still in Times Square. I keep me a place in Times Square. I keep me a studio in Times Square. Well, next time I'm in New York, I'll look you up. Maybe I can get a lesson with you too. Oh yeah, man! You you come by, and we'll hang out. Yeah. yeah. All right, Why bro. Not? Well, it's my honor that you did the show. It's my honor that you did the show. Uh, the show. The guys out there, uh, they can contact me at um, uh, carvinm at gmail.com. Okay, I'll put all that in the show notes and a link to your website. One little thing as we're leaving, the thing I really thought was so cool is on your website, on your personal website, is a page dedicated to golf. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you told me white ball, blue sky, happiness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know as, yeah, as as deep as this yeah, cat is, Michael. he's not taking himself too seriously. He's 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 on it. Oh man, just put the white ball in the blue sky. Get a hot dog in a beer after you leave the eighteenth hole and put your clothes in the car and tell your ass home. That's right, that's right. All right, well thank you so much and we'll 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 talk soon, Michael, okay? Michael, thank you so much. Out of all the drummers in the world, thank you for thinking about me, and I mean that, man. And all the best to you and your beautiful family. Thank you so much, sir. This is your host, Michael Vosbon, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols, Sound Synergies, at More Drum Academy and Classic Drummer Magazine. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.